For many countries in the world, foreign aid through so-called international development cooperation remains a very important source of uh, development finance. And this is particularly important these days in the SDG era to find new ways of financing requires not just mobilizing domestic revenue. Many low income countries rely on foreign aid to meet their normal budget expenses and to fund uh, the SDGs requires even more additional funding. Foreign aid, therefore, is a very important source for countries like Malawi, which rely on foreign aid to uh, to supplement uh, the, the national budget. So apparently around 30 to 40 percent of Malawi's budget uh, is dependent on foreign aid. And so for these countries, any messages coming from rich donor countries of, of um, aid being reduced and, and threats to re cut back on aid is of major concern. Consider the following. In 2018, according to official figures, official development assistance or ODA declined by 4.3%. In 2019, the total ODA in the world that was given was around 153 billion US dollars, uh, which is only 0.3% of GNI, gross national income, of these countries. Um, despite the UN having a target of 0.7% of GNI uh, that ought to be prioritized by rich countries in terms of foreign aid. Norway gives uh, at least 1% of its GNI, uh, but not every country is, uh, is generous. You also have some other countries that have repeatedly uh, been generous in terms of meeting their commitments, uh, like Luxembourg, Sweden, Denmark. In 2019, it also included the UK. The uh, interesting thing about uh, the foreign aid discourse is that um, uh, corresponding to uh, Brexit and the election of uh, Mr. Trump in 2016 in the US, uh, there has been this kind of increased focus on the national interest. There is much more focus uh, within some of these countries to fix problems for the middle class, for the working class. And there are um, major news headlines often claiming that aid is largely abused and that one should actually reduce this. And so I increasingly find much more of a focus on the national interest where major donor countries are now talking about how their own private sector can invest in some of these aid recipient countries. So in many ways, it is um, resembling a bit of the kind of policies that China often pursues uh, in many parts of the world, not least in Sub-Saharan Africa, where it is a combination of uh, some grants, uh, but also uh, economic uh, investments. And China, of course, talks about win-win. I'm not saying that the um, that the rich countries, that the donor countries are talking about win-win to the same extent, but there's certainly much more interest in getting something back. And trade is an important arena in this uh, context. You see for example, in recent years, there's been the UK Africa summit, there have been a Russia Africa summit, um, and India and China have, of course, been uh, holding regular summits with the African continent. So you similarly have um, countries like Germany cultivating much more bilateral ties, um, which uh, basically is promise some form of aid, but also uh, look aim to promote private sector investments. Now, uh, another important um, mechanism here has been blended finance, which basically um, the objective of, of blended finance is to unlock investment that the private sector would not have done on its own in support of national development priorities. So what one basically does is one uses public funds to crowd in private finance, thereby companies take less risk or, or the risks that they take in terms of investing in certain uh, social uh, arenas and uh, that would generate social returns, that kind of risk is reduced because uh, the taxpayer money is there to cushion that kind of risk. And this is becoming more and more popular, but there are also concerns in many parts of the world that companies uh, that should have been taking very minor risks uh, on very important arenas um, in terms of, say, poverty reduction, in terms of climate, whatever, uh, they are not willing to do so unless um, uh, the public funds arrive and thereby minimize their risk. But nonetheless, blended finance is, is an important uh, arena um, for 
for financing in relation to foreign aid, but also in relation to private sector investment. Uh, one arena where also the um, I see certain change, at least in the Nordic countries, in Norway, my own country, we've been very generously funding multilateral uh, agencies. We provide trust funds to the World Bank, but we also generously fund the UN. Now there is um, uh, much more of a discussion, uh, not necessarily from official sources, but at least in civil society, etc., the extent to which one should be maybe thinking about other sources of funding. Uh, and uh, But the response, of course, from official uh, officials is that the UN is undergoing a reform and many countries are cutting back on, uh, on support to the UN. So just a few uh, weeks ago, the United States threatened to cut back funding to the WHO, uh, and, and this is sort of a trend. So uh, the Nordic countries, Norway feels that we should at least support the UN. But there are many um, uh, scholars and, and practitioners who say that perhaps we should be uh, doing a bit uh, like what the Chinese do, rolling up our sleeves and undertaking projects on our own rather than outsourcing foreign aid money to multilateral development uh, agencies. Um, there is also this uh, feeling in some quarters that uh, rich countries tend to finance their own civil society uh, organizations to work in low-income country settings, uh, but that uh, they actually should be now focusing much more on funding uh, so-called southern CSOs, southern organizations that claim to take most of the risk, do most of the work, uh, and they don't get enough credit or enough money. So there's this kind of dissatisfaction between so-called northern and southern uh, civil society organizations. So you see all of these um, debates coming up in relation to uh, foreign aid. Uh, in this uh, context, it is also interesting to perhaps highlight the role of South-South uh, cooperation that India and China have been highlighting. Uh, and they've been very cleverly talking about um, how um, they have a track record of resolving many of the challenges that other low-income countries face and that maybe rich countries from the global north uh, may have money but they may not have the kind of solution. So we see here this kind of a shift uh, much more towards a South-South cooperation uh, and not least because China in particular is funding many of the projects that uh, traditional donors don't want to fund or haven't been funding for many decades. And these uh, include in particular infrastructure projects that many countries, uh, many low-income countries uh, want. So the international aid discourse is uh, getting more and more interesting in the sense that aid is declining. There's in many parts of the world less interest among citizens uh, to fund aid. In other parts of the world, aid still enjoys support like in the Nordic countries. But we do see uh, there's this kind of a convergence where uh, traditional donors are perhaps um, embracing and pushing for the private sector to be more involved in uh, in development and uh, in uh, in China etc one sees much more of an interest also to understand how the traditional donors have been administering aid the the, the extent to which um, uh, traditional donors have made their aid uh, resources much more efficient something that maybe China can learn more from but it should also be pointed out that China does not necessarily uh, provide that much in terms of grants as sort of free money, uh, China produce, uh, provides much more of concessional loans. And that's also an arena where there are many uh, actors claiming that or arguing that uh, traditional donors like the Nordic countries, like the UK, like the US should actually be providing much more concessional loans uh, so that countries can uh, fund uh, their own sustainable development uh, projects al uh, align with these national domestic priorities and that donors and other countries should not interfere that much. So the, the role of aid in financing development is going to be very interesting in, in the years to, to follow. I hope that aid does not get reduced at, and some of the threats that have been made to reduce, uh, uh, aid, to reduce aid will um, not actually take place and that countries will make much more resources available for promoting the SDGs, particularly in low-income country settings.